In 1985, Six Flags Great America opened Z-Force, a compact, thrilling roller coaster that was widely praised by enthusiasts. However, upon its eventual relocation to California's Six Flags Magic Mountain, it would receive an unwanted reputation as one of the worst roller coasters of all time. But how could such a promising attraction go down in such infamy? Let's find out today on Failed Coasters. Long before they built classic coasters like Millennium Force and Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure, Swiss manufacturer Intamin put out vastly different attractions. First founded in 1967, the company's name stood for International Amusement Installations. As its name implied, their main focus wasn't so much on building amusement rides, but installing them. More specifically, they would hire a variety of subcontractor companies to manufacture rides. Meanwhile, Intamin would be in charge of the design, sale, and installation installation of said attractions. They would work with manufacturers like Schwarzkopf and Wagner Biro, but perhaps the most notable of these subcontractors was Swiss manufacturer Jovanola. Originally founded as a metal forging shop in 1888, Jovanola would manufacture a wide variety of steel products. These included highway bridges, electrical power stations, and even submarines. Around the early 1980s, they would start working with Intamin in the coaster market. These two companies would team up to build several unique roller coaster models over the years. These included a steel bobsled coaster named the Swiss Bob, a stand-up coaster, and a revolutionary concept named the Space Diver, aka the world's first hairpin drop coaster. This compact coaster model promised big thrills and a small footprint, likely appealing to both small parks on a budget and big parks with limited space. The ride was reportedly designed by Walter Bolliger and Claude Mabillard, two Jovanola employees who would later go on to create the world-renowned manufacturer B&M. This coaster would be the first to use their special track design with a box section spine. This track would later go on to be one of the most iconic designs in the amusement industry. Needless to say, this famous track has humble beginnings on such a small-scale coaster. Intamin reportedly hoped to mass-produce this design, selling it to amusement parks all over the world. Soon enough, the Space Diver would end up catching the attention of Six Flags. In 1984, Six Flags acquired Marriott's Great America in Gurney, Illinois. The company had major plans for the park, and a massive expansion was in the works. So what better way to kick off a new era of the park than to add an impressive prototype roller coaster to its lineup? Between 1984 and 1985, the world's first space diver would be swiftly constructed. According to the Chicago Tribune, this new roller coaster would take 900 yards of concrete, 130 tons of steel, and 5,000 man hours to construct. After a swift installation process, the coaster would finally open to the public in the spring of 1985. The Force is here. The ultimate force. The world's first and only sea coaster. Designed to turn and twist and dive like no other force on Earth. Come ride the sea force. Only at Six Flags Great America. The ride experience and layout were described as innovative and revolutionary by many. After ascending a chain lift, passengers would take a 180 degree turn to the left. After maneuvering a straight section of track, passengers would descend down the first hairpin drop as the train twists in the opposite direction. These drops were so tight, they were often confused for inversions. After the first drop, riders would head back upwards before an S-curve took them into another dive. From there, the process pretty much repeated itself throughout the rest of the layout. After five tight drops, the ride would end with a helix before hitting the final brake run. The general layout was designed to emulate flying a fighter jet, with its rolling dive turns resembling flight maneuvers. Upon its initial construction, reception to the coaster was quite positive with enthusiasts. In an interview with CBS2 Chicago, one coaster enthusiast said, quote, It's a very good coaster, very good. The dives were terrific on it. In the same interview, a park guest said, quote, What's best about it is the turns, and you couldn't see what was coming up next. Come down those things, my stomach ended up in my throat. And one more park guest told CBS, quote, I thought it was great, exciting. Thrill seekers were blown away by the tight footprint and the intimidating drops of Z-Force. It was truly a one-of-a-kind roller coaster, 
and it seemed like it would be a long-standing hit for Great America. However, it would only operate for a paltry three seasons. But why would the park suddenly get rid of such a well-received attraction? The answer was Six Flags Ride Rotation Program. New attractions are necessary to increase attendance and keep guests coming. On the other hand, new rides are expensive, and buying a used ride is much less costly. So for these reasons, Six Flags put a program in place to periodically relocate their coasters to different parks. One of the most famous examples of this program was the Intamin stand-up coaster Shockwave, which would be relocated to New Jersey's Six Flags Great Adventure and Houston's now-defunct Six Flags Astro World. Naturally, Z-Force was no exception to this program, and in 1988, it would move to and reopen at Six Flags Over Georgia. Move ahead! It's so unique! Don't hesitate! Now rip it! Rip it good! New Z-Force! It's not just another ride in the park! Despite being a relocation, the ride's installation received plenty of media attention at the time. Newspapers all across Georgia would cover the park's newest attraction. As reconstruction was underway, Peach State enthusiasts were excited for the ride's eventual opening. Soon enough, the ride would open in 1988 to great fanfare, though its run at the park was just as brief as its Illinois stint. Just three years later in 1991, the coaster would operate in Georgia for the last time. The next year, Six Flags would relocate the coaster to what is now considered the best park in the chain, Six Flags Magic Mountain in Valencia, California. On April 25th, 1992, the coaster known as Z-Force would reopen to the public under a new name, Flashback. Its run at the park would be widely advertised, and its installation would drum up a considerable buzz in the area. I'm reading in the paper that Six Flags Magic Mountain has this new thrill ride called Flashback with six hairpin dives that send you totally topsy-turvy. So I call my best friend Mo and we drive up to where all the great rides are, like Viper, Cyclone, Roaring Rapids, and who is standing there but my total heart drop, Veronica. And she says, why don't we ride Flashback together? So we get on and my heart starts racing, we both start screaming, and now I can't decide which is more thrilling, Veronica or the Flashback? And I'm left wondering, could I be in love with a roller coaster? In the pre-internet days, not many people knew that this coaster previously ran at two different parks. As such, this coaster seemed brand new to local park goers. Nobody in the area had seen such an attraction before, and it seemed like a welcome addition to a park that was rapidly expanding its coaster collection. Unbeknownst to the guests though, this ride would go down in infamy as one of the worst roller coasters of all time. After being relocated twice, the coaster was in a far worse condition than when it originally opened in Illinois. Guests reported the ride experience to be much rougher, with each hairpin turn slamming riders' heads into their over-the-shoulder restraints. No matter how they held on to the restraints, the headbanging was inevitable. YouTube user Sir Willow went as far as to describe it as the worst roller coaster he's ever ridden. At Six Flags Magic Mountain, it was known as Flashback. And yes, this may actually be the single worst roller coaster I've ever been on. It would have snap diving turns. The problem was you had a lap bar and an over the shoulder restraint. And every time you snap turned, your legs would slam into your lap bar and your head would slam into the shoulder restraint. And so you get a slam bam every single turn. And there was no way to defend yourself for it, no way to brace for it, because as violently as it slammed you, you could hold on as tight as you want and you were still going to slam. It was just going to beat the crud out of you. With each passing year, the coaster's quality would reportedly get even worse. And as if that weren't bad enough, the ride couldn't even operate most of the time. Not because of maintenance issues, but because of its placement in the park. During its time at Magic Mountain, Flashback was located near the entrance and right next to the water park. This was a major problem, as the coaster's high noise level would distract the lifeguards. So if someone was calling for help, the ride's noise would keep the lifeguards from hearing it. The sound also annoyed water park goers, many of whom just wanted to relax and soak up the sun. As a result, park officials would prohibit flashbacks operation from May to September. Unfortunately, this also meant that the coaster could not run during the busiest time of the year. When flashback was installed in 1992, the park didn't have to worry about the water park since that wasn't built until 1995. Parkgoers wondered why the park bothered to operate the coaster when it couldn't even run during the busiest season. Flashback would operate sporadically all the way until 2003, when it was abruptly put into standing but not operating status. For around four years, this ride would sit abandoned on the property. A once hyped up coaster now seemed like a forgotten remnant in the park's history. Park officials had reportedly planned on relocating it to another area of the park, but nothing came of those plans. 
Instead, the ride was finally dismantled in 2007 and sold for scrap. Photos taken on the site show discarded pieces of the track forcefully ripped apart. A one-of-a-kind coaster once thought to be revolutionary was now facing a brutal demise. Soon enough, the track was all gone. Its plot of land would be reused for water park cabanas, but the station still sits on the property to this day. Intamin had hoped to mass-produce the Space Diver for several parks, but Flashback will forever be known as one of the biggest failures in roller coaster history. Special thanks to Chris from Airtime Thrills for making this video possible. He's got some great coaster content on his channel too, so if you want to check it out, I've put a link in the description. Before we wrap things up, I want to thank my newest Patreon supporters. Verbal shoutouts start at the gold tier, and if you don't hear your name, you will see it at the end of the video. Here is a special shoutout to Brian Gregory and Josh Hodson. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, I've put a link in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at ThemeParkCrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.